Good morning, and welcome to Connections Radio Show. I'm Lori Fitz, your host. And on our show, we like to look at all the different connections. The connections to ourself, our community, and our world. And we most like to investigate stories. How do our stories inform who we are and how we learn? And it's through stories as we go back to the beginning of time when we were warming ourselves by the fire and telling each other story that is the through line to who we are. It it, it helps us inform, give meaning, and uh, connect. And I always enjoy the first Saturday of the month because we have the Eastside Freedom Library as our 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 favorite spot <laughs> the first uh, week of the month and we have Peter Ratcliffe who is our co-host on these first Saturdays to share about all the wonderful things that are happening at the Eastside Freedom Library and today in, in particular we're going to be talking about story. Welcome Peter. Thank you Lori. Stories is really the heartbeat at the Eastside Freedom Library. Absolutely. And the the ways that people can tell stories. Mm-hmm. So everything from stand up, tell a story, to turn it into poetry, to use digital media, mm-hmm. to show a film, all ways of, of telling stories. And I think for us, listening and, and what we might call active listening, listening in a way that you bring your own self forward to engage with the story that you're being told. And being vulnerable to learn. Absolutely. I think that the the authentic learning process allows you to put aside maybe what you think you know mm-hmm. and be mm-hmm. willing to explore what you might not know or find the intersections mm-hmm. of how the stories are similar and yet be open to learning about all sorts of new ways that people create their sense of meaning. And I, I think that part of what's both challenging and satisfying about the process is the need to be willing to be uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and to discover that being uncomfortable doesn't have to be a permanent state of being, but a process through which you move to a deeper level of understanding. It's funny you should say that. We've been doing some workshops on unconscious bias. (laughs) And there was, um, at the end, we knew that folks were really getting into it because at the end it was like, my bias, Mm -hmm. (laughs) my bias. Mm -hmm. And how wonderful it is to admit that we can knock into things that we thought were a certain way. But we can move through them. And, mm-hmm. and that the uncomfortable is almost something you welcome. Like, oh, that's mm-hmm. the part that I didn't know. That's yeah. the part that I tripped up. Yeah. That's where I ran into like, ah, oh, uh, aha moment. Yeah. So l- let me give you an example of how all of this intersects at the Eastside Freedom Library. In July, one of our most best attended and liveliest events was a celebration of the 85th anniversary of the 1934 Minneapolis Teamsters strike tagline, the strike that made Minneapolis a union town. So that was a celebration. Mm -hmm. Now in August, we are going to host two events that ask us to consider the 100th anniversary of the Chicago race riot of the summer of 1919. A a topic that is probably even less known than the 34 Teamster strike Um, and one that many people would say, oh, my, there are so many difficult, hard things to think about in the world now. Why make me think about something horrible and difficult that happened a century ago? But it's still relevant. It's absolutely, absolutely still relevant. We're still dealing with it. Right. And we've got a president that calls to it. Yeah, in a big way. Yeah. Yes. And so this wonderful uh, veteran African-American journalist, Joseph Hill, Mm -hmm. came to us and said, I'm concerned that people don't know the story of the Red Summer of 1919, in which there were 25 major race riots in cities around the United States. Oklahoma was part of it. Oklahoma was part of it. Florida was part of it, but also, you know, Chicago yeah, was a right big part door. of it. Right. And so he's compiled 
uh, a way of telling the story that he's asked to come and share with us. And so on Thursday evening, August 22nd, Mr. Hill is going to come and present his account of the Red Summer of 1919. And then that gave me the idea that this is an opportunity to show one of my favorite films. And of course, all of my favorite films are lesser known, under the radar kind of films. And this is a film called The Killing Floor, which was made for WGBH in Boston in 1984 in a project headed by a woman named Elsa Rosbach, the first major film directed by African-American filmmaker Bill Duke, starring Moses Gunn and Alfre Woodard. And it's it's the story of African-American migrants to Chicago, their employment in the slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants, Mm -hmm. their efforts to unionize together with Eastern European immigrants, and the collapse of all of it in the horrific race riot in July and August of 1919. Oh, what a perfect partner. So um, we're going to show that film the following Thursday night, August 29th. Um, And I love to tell the story because I had a little bit of an involvement in the project in 1984 that this film was supposed to be the first in a series of 12 labor history films. They're not documentaries. They're dramatic films that WGBH was going to produce after this first film. All the corporate sponsors pulled out and none of the other 11 films were ever made. And so this film was so good that it terrified the corporations that had actually paid for it. So come and see this. Come and hear Mr. Hill on August 22nd. Come and see The Killing Floor on August 29th. And most importantly, bring your discomfort. Be prepared to sit and have a conversation after both events about how it is relevant in the summer of 2019 here in the Twin Cities. Amazing work. What it strikes me is that our racial tensions have been with us, you know, since colonists came. This is the 400th anniversary this year of the arrival of the first boatload of enslaved people in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia. So for 400 years, this this has been an important Mm -hmm. part of the story. And as Tom Hartman pointed out so well uh, at the last chapter bookstore a couple of weeks ago, um, the genocide fueled by guns uh, the genocide of Native Americans was an, the other matching chapter in the story of how the United States was born. And the Second Amendment takes on a different, Very different. connotation yes. when you understand that the guns were used to keep uh, people contained. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so how does containment become part of the way that we preserve – uh, a white culture, European descent style of, of living, and, and how can that be questioned into when we're built on an idea right. that all people are created equal? So right. how, how Supposedly. Do we, yeah, yes. How, yes. How does that tension right. and how does right. that discomfort right. get played out? Right. Oh. And, and I think that we're going to explore these kinds of questions in yet another way, in a way, again, using story and using art as a way to tell stories. Um, We are partnering with an existing partnership between the Sod House Theater Company and Black Label Movement Dance Company, who are adapting August Strindberg's classical Swedish play, The Ghost Sonata, into a play about immigration to Sweet Hollow, which will will be performed in September outdoors uh, in Sweet Hollow. But on Monday night, August 26th, the creative team and the actors will be at the Eastside Freedom Library to have a conversation with us about their process, what they are going to do outdoors for free in our neighborhood later in September, and and to try to, again, bring together the past and the present and to ask, what does the experience of Swedish immigrants in the mid-19th century have to say to Mexican, Salvadoran, 
um, Somali, Oromo, Amharic immigrants now in the second decade of the 21st century. And the How journey, do we tie these yeah. stories together? The journey of integration and community. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And how does that occur? And are there patterns that, yeah. that each uh, new immigrant group bring that create similarities and yet differences as well? Both. Yeah. Both. But that art is the way uh, to build these bridges and to make these explorations. Which is also the heartbeat of the East Side Freedom Ab- Library. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I know in the next few segments, we're going to be talking with some artists that you are working with for programs coming up. Yes. So stay tuned uh, for our next few segments. We'll have um, an artist that will be doing creative drama um, and working with immigrant communities, again, along those themes. And um, that's Taos and Mohammed who will be creating right. these plays. And then we're also going to have uh, authors join us in the third segment. So... Busy month, busy morning here. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after just a few short announcements, but we'll be back to talk about the Eastside Freedom Library and the artists that will be there this year, this month. Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association and Powderhorn Park are thrilled to invite you to the Powderhorn Art Fair. Shop hundreds of local and regional artists on serene Powderhorn Lake. Taste foods from local food trucks and enjoy exploring the Powderhorn community. Considered the best regionally juried art fair for nearly three decades, it takes place right in South Minneapolis in picture-perfect Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd and runs through Sunday, August 4th. Join the fun from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The success of the art fair comes from Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association's long-standing collaboration with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, and a portion of the proceeds support youth programming at Powderhorn Park. There'll be over 200 artists, 20 food trucks, and great fun at Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd, and runs through Sunday, August 4th. For more information on the art fair, go to ppna.org. That's ppna.org. Total Dog Company has a great rewards program. It's called the Frequent Barker Card. You earn punches on the card based on the amount you spend. One punch for every $10. After you get 12 punches, you can redeem the card for $10 off a purchase. Everything we sell qualifies, so you get points and use points on things you really want. The Frequent Barker Program at Total Dog Company in New Hope, right off of 169 at 9432 36th Avenue North, and at TotalDogCompany.com. This is New Beginnings, hosted by award-winning broadcaster and speaker, Freddie Bell. Freddie, this generation of the baby boomers, people are living longer, so the baby boomers are taking care of elderly parents. Let's talk about your health, and specifically, let's talk about Medicare. Our show features the concerns of America's 78 million baby boomers in employment, finance, health and nutrition, and even entertainment. Catch New Beginnings with Freddie Bell, Saturdays at 11 on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. I'm Peter Rackler from the Eastside Freedom Library, and I'd like to tell you about an historic place on Payne Avenue. Brunson's Pub is a place where history and passion are a part of every detail, starting with the menu. The Payne Phelan neighborhood arose from Dakota people who lived here for hundreds of years and pioneering immigrant communities, Irish, Swedes, German, and Italians, who made the East Side their home. More recently, waves of new residents from Asia, Latin America, and Africa continue the rich immigrant history and are revitalizing the community's cultural life and economy. Come experience Brunson's Pub at 956 Payne Avenue and grab a discounted gift card when you mention that you're an AM 950 listener or a supporter of the Eastside Freedom Library. Be sure to check out Brunson'sPub.com. Good morning, and welcome back to Connections Radio Show. I'm Lori Phipps, your host. And as you know, our show is about exploring a wide range of topics that challenge us to see ourselves, our community, and the world around us that gets us thinking. 
gets us talking, gets us imagining, um, gets us active, gets us out and doing something. And as you know, the first Saturday of the month is always our East Side Freedom Library. And I have my co-host, who is Peter Ratcliffe, who is also the co-executive director of the East Side Freedom Library. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Lori. Glad to be here. And as we talked about in the first segment, we've got some great guests coming up in the second and third uh, segments. So tell me a little bit about what the segment's going to be about. Well, we're uh, excited that we were able to get grant support uh, from MRAC, the Metro Regional Arts Council. Uh, We really need to thank the Minnesota taxpayers uh, for having provided the resources for MRAC to dole out in these grants. It's a wonderful organization that really is committed to the community. Absolutely. And so this is an arts learning grant. And so the Eastside Freedom Library is providing the space and helping to recruit the youthful participants for our friends, the uh, teacher artists, Taos Chasm and Mohammed. And they are doing a two-week workshop called the Ogress and the Fig Tree, Ooh. which will work with young people to transform folk tales into performance. And then we will get to reap the benefits and enjoy the results at the end of the two weeks. And what's wonderful, it's such a multicultural community. And you'll be drawing such unique and wonderful group of kids to be part of this. Right. And and I think ideally it also it will encourage the kids to think about the cultural and intellectual richness that is within their own communities, often articulated through the form of folk tales, um, they're bringing great roots and resources to this process. And Taos and Muhammad are skilled at identifying and teasing out those resources and, and making something exciting from them. Well, Taos, I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. What I get excited about is learning about how artists have been able to collaborate with the Eastside Freedom Library and be able to do your work in conjunction. Tell me a little bit about how you found out about being the, having the opportunity to work with the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, it, I've known Peter um, for many years, and um, we chatted, I think, after a performance that my husband had done with Frank Theater last fall um, of a play called The Visit about how we might collaborate and how he might bring Mohammed and I into the Eastside Freedom Library as artists. Um, and one thing that Mohammed and I have been doing for um, many, many years is working with kids um, to create original plays um, based on a variety of themes. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work um, with folk tales lately. Um, I produced a show in 2017 called Sunrise at Midnight based on Algerian folk tales, um, geared actually more towards adults rather than children. But um, And I've also created a theater in Algeria uh, based on folk tales that I've um, worked with young women um, going up into mountain villages and listening to um, elder women tell and then rework those into an original production. So um, I've also been teaching with the Bridges program um, through Children's Theater, which also looks at um, folk tales and um, how young people can find their own voice within the folk tale and change the story um, if they feel that the story and the narrative need changing um, and have agency within that. So Um, We're also going to be working this year um, with another grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Um, Again, thank you, Minnesota voters, uh, at the um, L'Etoile du Nord uh, French Immersion School on North African folktale specifically. So in this program this summer, we're going to be working with a North African folktale, a Hmong folktale, and a Somali folktale with uh, the students. They'll have an opportunity to see which of the stories they would like to focus on to develop more into their own um, performance. And you've been doing this this summer with some other communities around the Minnesota area. I've been working with a group of Iraqi refugees and immigrants um, on their own stories, so not necessarily on a folktale, but on uh, um, creating, we created a show based on their experiences as immigrants and refugees um, and the challenges of moving to the United States uh, from Iraq 
um, that's with the uh, Iraqi American Reconciliation Project, and I developed that with another theater artist named Dylan Fresco, who um, helped us develop the script um, through storytelling with those participants. Um, we worked on that with objects. We had everyone bring in an object and tell the story of that object, and then that sort of um, dominoed into digging a little deeper into different stories. And so that show is called Birds Sing Differently Here. And um, we performed it at the Guthrie in 2017. And then um, IARP, Iraqi American Reconciliation Project, received an arts tour grant. Once again, thank you, Minnesota State (laughs) Arts Board, um, to take that show uh, to um, Rochester, St. Cloud, Duluth. And then we Uh, wrapped up that tour with two shows at the Southern Theater. And that's a show where we have four uh, professional actors, Mohammed, uh, my husband, Mohammed Yabdri included, as well as Amir Siddiqui, Ashanti Ford, and then Dylan Fresco performing with six uh, Iraqi storytellers to tell their stories. And this has already taken place, the the Southern Theater? Correct. Yep. That was last uh, Thursday and Friday was the that tour wrap up uh the group is really excited to think about how to take that show nationally so stay tuned Mm -hmm. well and i'll let our listeners know because i'm sure they'd like to support it and if there is another show that comes up that uh, please let me know absolutely we'd love to get the word out it Mm -hmm. sounds like a fascinating production performance um, that allows you to hear and understand different stories absolutely and, and language and celebrate that yes so you're getting ready to do a two-week workshop. At the end of the workshop, will there be a performance that communities can come and that are parents and whatnot to see the show? Absolutely. Um, it will be short. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> sure. It'll probably be about a 10-minute performance of uh-huh. uh, what we work on throughout the program, throughout the two weeks. And we're excited that this opportunity has brought us into a relationship with the Boys and Girls Club of of the Twin Cities, and they're going to provide at least 10 uh, young participants. But I want listeners to know that there is still room, um, and if if people visit the Eastside Freedom Library website, uh, www.eastsidefreedomlibrary.org, they can register uh, for their kids or loved ones to come and participate. And they don't have to necessarily have an acting talent. I mean, oh, I, no. I remember... We years, all have acting yeah, talent. Well, we all have already. acting talent, but let's say if a child is shy, I mean, mm-hmm. there's still an opportunity for... Um, a creative drama to include everyone and be able to share your gifts and be able to discover those gifts together. Absolutely. And it's very playful and very, Mm -hmm. um, every child loves a good story and, and the let's pretend and make believe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we do, we use different techniques so that if someone is not comfortable with a speaking role, there's choral speaking opportunities. So maybe you're Mm -hmm. speaking in a group of five Mm -hmm. or a group of three. So, a, that helps. Of, oh, what's my line? And you have other people to <laughs> yes. lean on. Right. Um, there are other students we've worked with in the past who don't want to have a speaking part, and that's absolutely fine. They can just focus on the movement. They can focus on being part of the bigger group. Um, and also, we're going to work on making some props and some costumes, simple stuff, Um But if that's something someone else is really interested in, they can do that too. And tell me the dates again. So if people want to sign up, what dates would their kids be coming to the show, uh, coming to the program to learn how to do the creative drama? Uh, It will be August 12th to the 16th. That's going to be from 9 to 12. And then August 19th to the 23rd from 2 to To 5. Well, so if you've got kids or grandkids that might want to participate in something fun and also learn about different cultures and stories and understanding, um, this would be a wonderful opportunity, and I highly recommend it. And there's lots for parents and grandparents to do at the Eastside Freedom Library while their kids are in the workshop. So why don't you give the website and encourage folks to check out both the calendar and the sign-up. Great. So it's www.eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. And you're listening to the Progressive Voice of Minnesota here on AM 950. And... You're part of Connections Radio Show, and I want you to stay tuned because we've got another wonderful conversation coming up about some other great things that are happening at the Eastside Freedom Library. So stay with us. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Do you suffer from anxiety about the current state of politics? Are you confused or easily angered by the president? It's my party, and I'll lie if I want. 
to lie if I want to. Do you have an overwhelming feeling that something is going terribly wrong with the country, but don't know if Democrats are the answer? If you just stick with me, with Democrats, we'll quickly see. Seize defeat from jaws of victory. Tax extend. Join us then. We will screw it up again. You can't control what happens in Washington, D.C., but you can take command over how it affects you by coming to see the Capitol Steps. The Capitol Steps can provide relief from political anxiety disorder. So ask your doctor if the Capital Steps are right for you. The Capital Steps. They put the muck in democracy. Capital Steps brings their show to the Ordway on Friday, August 9th at 730. Purchase tickets at Ordway.org. That's Ordway.org. I'm Connie Burek, co-host of Awakened Living Infusion Radio Show. Join Michelle Kitzmiller and I as we focus on all aspects of health, wellness, spirituality, and growth from a mind, body, spirit, emotion perspective. On the Awakened Living Radio Show, we will discuss stress, self-care, fear, happiness, beliefs, communication, joy, pain, trauma, and more. Join us for the Awakened Living Infusion Radio Show Saturdays at 10 a.m. Let us share with you ways to infuse vitality into life. Legal issues, never fun, and they're certainly stressful. While it's tempting just to Google your legal situation, there is a better way. The Hennepin County Bar Association. Their referral counselors can answer many of your questions, like do you even need an attorney? And if you do, what type? They can connect you to a network of over 200 thoroughly vetted, qualified attorneys practicing in over 50 areas of law. Call 612-752-6666 or search for Hennepin County Bar Association. The right call for the right lawyer. Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association and Powderhorn Park are thrilled to invite you to the Powderhorn Art Fair. Shop hundreds of local and regional artists on serene Powderhorn Lake. Taste foods from local food trucks and enjoy exploring the Powderhorn community. Considered the best regionally juried art fair for nearly three decades, it takes place right in South Minneapolis in picture-perfect Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd and runs through Sunday, August 4th. Join the fun from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The success of the art fair comes from Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association's long-standing collaboration with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. And a portion of the proceeds support youth programming at Powderhorn Park. There'll be over 200 artists, 20 food trucks, and great fun at Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd and runs through Sunday, August 4th. For more information on the art fair, go to ppna.org. That's ppna. Org. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Sam Turnberg. Today there's a chance of storms. The high near 85. Well, tonight's going to be partly cloudy with a low around 66. Tomorrow's mostly sunny with a high near 86. Monday, a chance of storms with a high near 84. And Tuesday, sunny with a high near 80. The Powderhorn Art Fair is here. Today and tomorrow, the Powderhorn Art Fair will celebrate 28 years of art and community in idyllic Powderhorn Park. And the proceeds will fund youth and community programming. That's today and tomorrow at Powderhorn Park. More info at ppna.org. Welcome back to Connections Radio Show. I'm Lori Fitz, your host. And today we are celebrating the Eastside Freedom Library as we do every first Saturday of the month. And we have Peter Ratcliffe, who is my co-host and who's also the co-executive director of the Eastside Freedom Library. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Lori. Peter, you always bring wonderful guests. I'm I'm a lucky guy. (laughs) You've got a wonderful program that celebrates so many good people. We have two authors coming up in this segment. Tell me a little bit about who will be joining us in this segment. So, Teresa Warburton and Josh Soretti are two authors. Uh, Teresa has co-edited um, a book entitled um, Shapes of Native Nonfiction. Um, I imagine this will be of great interest to people in the local community, given how exciting it's been to have this exhibit of Native American women's art at the MIA. Uh, and I'm sure that this material will interface with that in some pretty exciting ways. And then Josh Soretti, who has written a book called Shape, uh, excuse me, called Abuses of the Erotic, Militarizing 
sexuality in the post-Cold War. Um, I wasn't sure that we are in a post-Cold War <laughs> period, but um, maybe people in the Kremlin and the White House think we are, but uh, it's pretty hard to tell. And, and I think in both cases, these are works that, as the East Side Freedom Library um, has really emphasized over our five years now of existence, um, these are artistic resources that lead us to build bridges and think critically about the world that we live in. So we're very excited to have these two people joining us. And also story has been the heart of what you do. Absolutely. And when you can celebrate authors that that share these stories, it it resonates at a deeper level, I think. Sure. And from the folktales that Taos and Muhammad will be working on um, to this quite carefully crafted literature that Teresa and Josh are bringing to us. And this takes place um, for their presentation right. on Mo- Monday, August 12th, August 12th. Um, at 7 p.m. Well, Teresa, let's start with you. Um, you yeah. you have been doing some editing work with Alyssa Washuta. Mm-hmm. Yep. And this is tell me about the process that you went through to help develop um, this native nonfiction work. Uh, these are a collection of essays, correct? Yes. Um, collection of nonfiction craft form. We are, we're saying form conscious essays. So essays that are really um, paying attention to the craft of storytelling and how the essay is formed. Um, and Alyssa, uh, we like to say actually that Amazon set us up because Amazon recommended her book to me. Um, and I bought it and loved it. And I brought her up to Western Washington University where I was teaching at the time. And we hit it off immediately. And she had told me that she was thinking of doing this collection, but felt like as a creative writer, she wasn't sure that she could do it by herself. It's a lot of work to do an anthology, um, a lot of sort of rote, you know, thousands of emails, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But she also wanted a more to have like a literary scholar to to sort of work with in the creation of the project. And so we decided to work on it together. Um, and doing that as a native and non-native scholar, um, set of scholars and writers, we've part of the process has been navigating some really sort of pragmatic things about that. Who who takes on which kind of labor, um, and who gets you know when we're writing in the introduction and saying we, who is the we in that, and how are we careful about how we use that kind of language? And what are some of the ways that you have learned through this process that? may be informative to uh, Native and non-Natives in the process of doing work together? I think that following the lead of Alyssa has always been the priority and following, and not just of Alyssa, but of the writers and the collection and that part of what I really wanted to do as an editor and as somebody who was trying to represent their work was to do it in a way that felt responsible and accountable to how they wanted the work to look. So to not do the sort of interpretive work of Native literature that acts sort of like it's a resource that I can sort of take stuff from and then um, do whatever I want with it. Appropriate it in ways. Exactly, and to really um, honor that work that they're doing, not just as Native writers, but as writers, and to say that they are really making important interventions into the field of nonfiction and into the field of literature, and to be accountable to that. So we did a lot of like going back and forth with writers to make sure that is this how you want it to look on the page? And, you know, is this, we sent them the introduction when we wrote it to make sure that it seemed like it represented the work well. Um, And for me, it's been all about willing, being willing to do the work that I think a lot of people sometimes feel is beneath them. Like just stuff like answering tons of emails, um, you know, doing the copy edits, just making sure that I'm taking on a significant amount of the work um, so that the writers in the collection and so that Alyssa can have the time and space to do the the really amazing writing work that they're doing. Is there a particular essay that moved you that you could share a little bit about with us? I love so many of them. Um, um, I mean, one I read, so before we did the collection, when I had already met Alyssa, I read her essay, Apocalypse Logic, which is in the collection um, and is amazing. I teach it all of the time to students. I think that it deals really well with thinking about how the current political moment 
is an extension of settlement and is an extension of colonialism instead of um, being the sort of aberration. It actually like is deeply related to that history. Um, so I love Alyssa's essay, and I also really like um, Bojan Lewis's. I, I'm trying. He has two essays in in the collection, so I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, but he has a what is essentially a travel essay um, about traveling around Singapore and some other places. And I really like the way that he has taken up the travel essay and um, sort of pushes against this idea that Native people are really just located in one place and um, and actually presents this really worldly, you know, travel narrative um, well, that is related to personal um, experiences also. Well, picking so I up, love, but I love all of them. Well, picking <laughs> up on Alyssa Washuda's that was looking at the apocalypse, which is, yeah. I think, somewhat a, a mm. good segue yes. over yes. to looking at the abuses of the erotic and militarizing sexuality in the post-Cold War United States. Josh, tell me a little bit about that work. Yeah, so the really the thrust of my book, Abuses of the Erotic, is that to uh, understand our current crisis, whether we're thinking about the deployment of troops within the borders of the United States or that's happening now at the border, or whether we're thinking about troops being deployed abroad, our bloated military budget, to understand these things, we really need to go back to this moment of possibility at the end of Col- the Cold War. And that was something that people talked about, that there was a peace dividend, that we were going to enter this new era of global peace and cooperation. And, of course, for those of us who have been around for the last 30 years know that didn't happen. The United States continues to spend more and more on its military and continues to use militarized violence both within and outside of the borders it claims. And so... What I try to do is to understand how we got to that moment. And looking at it, we can see that gender and sexuality were a really crucial fulcrum to maintaining that militarization. Once the primary justification for the United States global military presence, that that is the Soviet Union, the Cold War, you know, with the fall of communism there, supposedly there's this opportunity for peace. And the main justification for war, anti-communism, disappears. So we start to see new justifications. We start to see the advent of humanitarian imperialism, where the United States increasingly uses gender and sexuality as these fulcrums, as these ways to gain support and to justify militarization abroad. So whether that be claims of sexual violence happening in places abroad, whether it be talking about the sort of relatively progressive gender and LGBTQ politics of the U.S., whether that be talking about reproductive politics, we can see all of these forces being bent in order to support militarization and to camouflage these projects. And I think that, you know, becomes very clear when we think about how the current executive began his campaign with accusations that people from Mexico had a proclivity for sexual violence, right? He said he said they're rapists, mm-hmm. right? And that was the claim on which a lot of this so-called border crisis and the deployment of troops within the borders of the U.S., it's based on this idea, right, that this excess improper sexuality of Mexican men then can justify this enormous militarized violence that most negatively impacts women and children from Mexico and Central America. It's bizarre, isn't it? It is, it is truly you know, and and when once you start seeing it, you start to see it kind of everywhere. Yeah, like what um, what's wrong with this picture? We're vigilantes for not letting uh, Mexicans come across that are going to rape our white women, but we can put you know brown babies and brown women and brown men in cages, and that's absolutely. okay. Uh, yeah, we see a lot of ways in which you know the the logic of the current war on terror is that we need to do this violence that that so negatively impacts children Mm -hmm. in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen and elsewhere. 
in order to protect children in the United States, right? right? To protect them from the threat of terrorism. But actually that that rhetoric of protection is leading to an enormous amount of real violence done to young people and old people around the world. Well, it's it's great to listen to the both of you because it makes me aware of how you're coming to a place, the East Side Freedom Library, where these are exactly the conversations that our community is is having conversations uh, about settler colonialism uh, conversations prompted by a discussion about murals at the St. Paul City Hall conversations prompted by questions about the future of something called Indian Burial Mounds Park Mm -hmm. um, and uh, conversations about immigration and the border and and conversations in which we try to hold up mirrors to look at ourselves in new ways. Mm, And and I I think both of you guys are going to be agitators in the Frederick Douglass sense. In all good ways. In all good ways, (laughs) yeah. We're ready. We're ready. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, it's so it is it is that. fascinating to hear both of you share your experience, and mm-hmm. it opens new doors of thought and good conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. and your kind of work allows us to uh, look at the world uh, with perhaps a wider perspective. Yeah, and you know, the, for the listeners out there, we will have copies of both of these books available. Um, so that you can go deep uh, beyond whatever conversation we're able to have on August 12th. You can continue your conversation. You can continue it, <laughs> absolutely, much as much as Teresa started and has continued a conversation with Alyssa. Um, these are the kinds of conversations that we want to have from the radio to the East Side Freedom Library into the community itself. Absolutely. And again, that's on Monday, August 12th. 7 7 p.m. And for more information, you can go to the eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Yep. And you can go to the event page or you can just take a look. When you go to the website, there are so many cool things happening at the Eastside Freedom Library. We can't cover all the amazing things that are happening. We we give you highlights. Uh, But it's our opportunity to bring the Eastside Freedom Library to the uh, AM 950 progressive audience to have you be a part of it, even if you can't be there. But we want you to be there. We want you to be there. (laughs) Absolutely. So you two, safe, safe travels getting out here. Um, we look forward to seeing you. It'll be a great event and a great week. Thank we you. We always love coming to Minneapolis. We're so excited. Thank you so much. Safe travels. Thank and you. And you're listening to AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota for Connections Radio Show. And stay with us. We're going to be telling you more about some fabulous events coming up at the Eastside Freedom Library that we want you to be a part of. So stay tuned. Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association and Powderhorn Park are thrilled to invite you to the Powderhorn Art Fair. Shop hundreds of local and regional artists on serene Powderhorn Lake. Taste foods from local food trucks and enjoy exploring the Powderhorn community. Considered the best regionally juried art fair for nearly three decades, it takes place right in South Minneapolis in picture-perfect Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd and runs through Sunday, August 4th. Join the fun from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The success of the art fair comes from Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association's long-standing collaboration with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. And a portion of the proceeds support youth programming at Powderhorn Park. There'll be over 200 artists, 20 food trucks, and great fun at Powderhorn Park. The Powderhorn Park Art Fair begins Saturday, August 3rd and runs through Sunday, August 4th. For more information on the art fair, go to ppna.org. That's ppna.org. Org. Visit the wine bar at Cafe Latte and enjoy a unique handcrafted pizza and glass of wine. The perfect place for an intimate night or an evening with friends. Choices range from spicy Italian sausage and sweet roasted peppers to the one-of-a-kind nacho chicken pizza layered with blue corn tortilla chips. The approachable wine list offers over 30 by the glass with special emphasis on wines from Washington State. End your night with one of Cafe Latte's melt-in-your-mouth desserts, 850 Grand Avenue, St. Paul. 
Chances are, after spring cleaning, you missed a spot. A couple really big spots, like your roof and siding. Run your fingers across your siding. You'll likely get a gross residue. And your roof probably has some black streaks, too. Your roof and siding aren't always easy to clean, but they're definitely the most visible parts of your home that give it its curb appeal. So let Blue Sky Services clean your roof and siding. Blue Sky's safe soft wash method won't cause any damages and will make your home look like new. Right now, Blue Sky Services is running their summer special where you can get your whole house, roof, and siding clean starting at only $447. That's the most viewed parts of your home clean for only $447. Then mention AM950 when you call Blue Sky Services to get an additional $50 off. So get the curb appeal back on your home and call Blue Sky Services at 952-467-2447. That's 952-467-2447. I'm Peter Rackler from the Eastside Freedom Library, and I'd like to tell you about an historic place on Payne Avenue, Brunson's Pub. Experience history and passion through the delicious menu, reflecting the East Side's diversity. The choices are limitless. Salads, sandwiches, burgers, and shareable plates. Visit Brunson's Pub at 956 Payne Avenue and grab a discounted gift card when you mention that you're an AM 950 listener or a supporter of the East Side Freedom Library. Be sure to check out Brunson'sPub.com. Welcome back to Connections Radio Show. I'm Laurie Fitz, your host, and we have Peter Ratcliffe, the co-host today, who is the co-executive director of the Eastside Freedom Library. And if it's the first Saturday of the month, it's all about the Eastside Freedom Library. Lucky us. Oh, yeah. We're always, always having a good conversation here. And what a great day it's been. Having uh, the opportunity to talk about folk tales mm -hmm. and the great creative drama and opportunities for kids to come and be part of that. Mm -hmm. And also those great books that we're looking at um, that on August 12th right. that we just heard. Uh, authors really give some really fascinating background on, you know, what it means to work in connection between Native and non-Native as well as, you know, looking at how have we uh, basically sexualized military yeah. uh, assumptions mm -hmm. and what those assumptions have led us to. Um, very powerful. And so August 12th will be uh, the invitation for artists, uh, yep. for folks to come and, and learn about these books and Make talk about the It's not yeah, war. That's yes. right. That's yeah. right. So there's lots of other things going on this month. Um, there are things going on this weekend. And um, as the first Saturday of the month, uh, every other first Saturday, we do a partnership with a young group of young Ethiopian poets who call themselves Rhythmic Literature. And they will be at the library later this afternoon, early this evening, uh, roughly five to eight. Um, not only reading poetry uh, in Amharic, in Tigrayan, in Oromo, in English, uh, bringing poets from other Ethiopian communities. And, and many of us may be aware uh, that we are the site of a growing Ethiopian and internally diverse Ethiopian community here in Minnesota um, and that they are tuned in to what is going on in their homeland, uh, where a new young prime minister was elected a year ago, who immediately negotiated a peace treaty with Eritrea after 30 years of declared warfare, um, who has let thousands of political prisoners uh, out of prison. Um, there is a great deal going on in Ethiopia. And these young poets are using their art uh, to tell the stories of their culture and their community and to explore ways to make a better future. Um, we, we think at the Eastside Freedom Library that engaging the past, taking in the, the difficult as well as the inspirational is a way to build a better future. We're excited to be providing the space and, and working with these young Ethiopians. So come and join us this afternoon at 5. Um, if you're more inclined to quiet contemplation, uh, join us tomorrow, Sunday, uh, the first Sunday of every month at four in the afternoon. We have what we call Book Geek Happy Hour, <laughs> and we invite people to come bring a book that you're already reading um, or uh, 
pick a book off the shelf, sit and read for 90 minutes, and then sit in a circle with other people who have been there reading and just talk a little bit about why you're reading what you're reading and, and how you might or might not uh, recommend it to to other people. Um, but be in conversation. But be in conversation. And, and so uh, I have just finished uh, – there, there. Oh, um, the Native American the, the, yes. just won an by award. Ta- Tommy yeah. Orange, uh, set in Oakland, California. Um, I have to say, a very uh, difficult, uncomfortable book to read, uh, but one we should all uh, take a deep dive into. And I'm about to start Megan Marsnick's novel Underground oh. about the experiences of Eastern European women in the 1916 Iron Range strike. So that's what I'm going to be reading on (laughs) on Sunday afternoon. Um, And then I I also want to say, you know, if we're interested in directly engaging the world, um, we have really discovered in the last two months at the Eastside Freedom Library that housing – is really a hot-button issue in our community. Um, We have had a series of films and community conversations. We're going to continue on August 13th. Um, It will be an opportunity to hear from people who are currently working with both the Minnesota Housing Authority, the state organization, and the City of St. Paul uh, housing organization. So um, we, we're going to find out what government at both the city and state level they're doing. And then hopefully we're moving towards some sort of organization of people on the east side to be able to refine uh, what we want in terms of access to housing and how to get it. And so join us. The, the last event we had 138 people came. And, I and it was to, in a winter, right? Yeah. Wasn't no, it? this was just a couple couple weeks ago. Oh, there was so another one that was oh, – each, each, each one of these has been big. <laughs> Good. This Good. one, we had to send somebody out front to keep a watch out for the fire marshal and make sure he didn't come around. <laughs> but join us on August 13th to take part um, in in this conversation. Housing justice. Housing – how to find housing – how to make housing justice. So, you know, this wide range of activities in August is not at all unusual for the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, And then I would also add that we will be celebrating on Tuesday the 6th, National Night Out. Um, We will be grilling. Um, We will have live music. We will have games and crafts provided by uh, the Arlington Hills Rec Center, the Arlington Hills Public Library, our neighbors, the Arlington Hills Lutheran Church. So the Eastside Freedom Library will be the place, but organizations and people from across the neighborhood will come to make community with each other on Tuesday night the 6th. And I, I hope that everyone listening has your own neighborhood event uh, to attend. But if you don't and you want to feel welcome somewhere and stand shoulder to shoulder with us, come on over to the Eastside Freedom Library at 1105 Greenbrier on Tuesday the 6th between 5 and 8. And one last shout out for the guests who joined us, the Ogress and the Fig Tree Folk Tales for, into Theater for Kids. Um, it starts on August 12th, goes through the 16th from 9 a.m. to 12. And then the second part goes from August 19th through the 23rd, 4.30 to 7.30. Going to be a fabulous time for kids and there are still spaces available. And then we have Make Baskets, Not War, two new books for the struggle. Um, the two books are Abuses of the Erotic. And that's looking at the militarization of uh, sexuality in our war making and shapes of native nonfiction, which is a a collection of essays. And you'll hear from the editor on that. And that's going to be Monday, August 12th at 7 p.m. And you're listening to AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota here on Connections Radio Show. Stay with us next Saturday, but always make sure you tune in for the first Saturday of the month for the Eastside Freedom Library. We're thrilled to be here, Lori. Thank you.